Mini episode 1650 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1650. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris coming at you. And uh, for this mini episode, uh, we are going to be breaking down the 2023 college football season. And in terms of how we've done it the last couple of years, it's all been the same way. We're doing it here today with a great dignitary of the FDH Lounge. He is a writer for our Sports Central. He covers football at all levels, professional college, uh, you name it, he's been writing about it in the world of football. Fran Stuckberry, and he is uh, pushing through it here today. He is being a pro. I know that he's a little bit under the weather, but uh, he is keeping the commitment, and we really, really appreciate it. Fran, great to have you here to take a look ahead at the 2023 NCAA football season. Thanks, Rick. Happy to help out. Glad to have you, and uh, in terms of what we're looking at here, there's a number of overarching stories for the season. We have, of course, uh, FDH Senior Editor Jason Jones, right in the heart of one of the biggest stories, of course, uh, Deion Sanders coming to Colorado and coaching there with an unprecedented amount of turnover on that roster. He's been covering that for Sports Illustrated as well as his own After Further Review with Jones Sports Channel. You can check all of that out on YouTube and in sports at Sports Illustrated uh, website. But as far as it goes with, uh, with that story, you've got Georgia going for the three-peat which uh, pretty much nobody in our lifetime has seen. Any number of big stories for the season here. What are some of the other biggest ones that jump out at you, Fran? Well, this is the last year of the fourth team playoffs. That's the big thing. I mean, sure. This is the last year where uh, you won't be talking about a lot of different teams during the offseason. Well, that's right. And rivalries, right? It's the, We don't know if a lot of these rivalries are going to persist past this season, whether it be Bedlam, whether it be the Civil War, whether it be the Apple Cup, all these things at risk as the migration to the conferences, the new conferences, happens in 2024. And we'll be talking about that in a subsequent segment in a lot of detail. But these rivalries, uh, this is one of these things where, again, you better be watching these games when they happen. Most of them will be in November. But you better be catching them when you happen. They, they happen because, again, we know they'll happen again someday. It always does. There's money in it. But generally, there's money in it the further along it takes to get there. So you don't know when the next edition of these rivalries is going to be. Well, that's pretty true, right? especially with some of the conferences that they play nine game schedules. That's pretty tough to get that extra non conference game in there. But, uh, I mean, never say never in college football. I mean, eventually, you know, they will come together and at least want like a one game series, two game series, maybe even in a bowl game. But we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. Very much so. And in terms of how that goes, it's one of those things. I actually think a nine game schedule. And in these now more loaded, more difficult conferences, I think it makes it less likely it's going to happen because as much as possible, everybody wants to get cupcake games in there. I know with my dad being an Ohio State season ticket holder, I was fortunate enough to get with him last year and and my brother, who's a Notre Dame alum. uh, We were at the Notre Dame game in Columbus last year and we'll be at the game in South Bend in a couple of weeks. So that's kind of the exception to the rule. But like for Ohio State, most of the rest of them have been like Youngstown State, Tulsa, you know, like Ohio State's trying to pad that win-loss record as much as possible, and they're not alone in this. So that is something that mitigates against these rivalries going forward on a regular basis because as much as possible, those teams are going to want to use the three non-conference games to heighten their playoff resumes for, for uh, you know, it'll be a 12-team uh, playoff subsequently going forward here, but uh, if you're nine and three, let's just say that's going to put you on the bubble. So you're going to want to get as many wins as you can in the non-conference games. Uh, that's definitely true, Rick. Um, but uh, in this year, we'll see what we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll happens with the four teams. I mean, uh, we'll see who, who gets there. I mean, just some front runners and then maybe some dark horses. We shall see how it plays out. Yes. So this season has. 
the look of a changing of the guard in a lot of ways as far as the structure of college football. It doesn't have the look of a changing of the ways when it comes to the major powers in college football because, again, this is all dictated by, to some degree, coaching, yes, but more than anything else, recruiting. And the super recruiters out there are the ones that have their teams towards the top. For example, the relative fall off of Clemson in recent years has had to do with uh, their recruiting and with not being quite able to keep pace with Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, the traditional powers in that regard. So we look at the SEC East where you have the two-time defending champion Georgia Bulldogs, and uh, as much as I'd like to believe that my Tennessee Vols can take them out, uh, that is going to be a heck of a game when it happens. But Georgia comes into the season, I think, uh, as the, the clear favorites in the SEC East, I think the decent favorites in the SEC and I think at least moderately decent favorite to three-peat and have uh, Kirby Smart holding up the trophy again in January. H how do you see it breaking down for them, Fran? Well, with the exception of, 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 a, of a game against Tennessee, it looks like they definitely have a clear path to making it to the, um, to, to the top to the top four. I mean, the, um, and, the, and the SEC, we'll see, we'll see, if, we'll see if LSU you can, find, can make the next level because they lose a heartbreaking game in the Florida State last year. This year, that's a must-win game for, for LSU and Brian Kelly in the second season of the team. I think that's a must-win game. game. It might be a lock week one for LSU to be forced. Yes, that is going to be uh, one of the big uh, non-conference games of the year, uh, if not the biggest. And uh, in the East Division, where you've got Tennessee trying to nip at the heels of Georgia, and then from there, South Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, a couple of teams that – I don't look like they're on the doorstep of getting that done, at least this year. The Western Division, as you point to, you've got LSU in year two with Brian Kelly. And uh, pretty much uh, after that disastrous Cajun accent that he was trying to affect, just about everything went well for Brian Kelly from that point on. And he did have the look of, uh, again, being able to potentially build a national power at LSU to rival what Nick Saban was putting together back in the day, the thing that became the stepping stone for him to get the Dolphins job and then the Alabama job, ironically. So uh, Brian Kelly knew he'd be able to recruit better at LSU because, let's face it, most schools don't have the recruiting standards that Notre Dame does. So you've got LSU there. You've got Mississippi uh, continuing to build something there with Lane Kiffin, as much as I don't want to admit it as a Tennessee fan. It's definitely true. Texas A&M not wanting to admit that they have a lemon in Jimbo Fisher at this point, and perhaps this season is going to be kind of a fulcrum season either way for him as far as making it to the end of his contract or getting blown out early. So the West Division, I thought it was a little bit deeper a year ago, uh, but again, we haven't even mentioned Auburn where uh, there's, you know, it, it wouldn't be an Auburn season if there wasn't some turmoil there that they were coming off of, right? So I feel, feel like the West was a little deeper a year ago but it is still, to me, one of the deeper divisions in college football. Well, we still have a little, like, quarterback that's running in Alabama. Right? You know, if you're going to have them with the mobile quarterback, you're going to have the throwing quarterback. Mm -hmm. there's, still some, there's still something, you know, that's running with Alabama. People still think Alabama's going to have a good year, but if they lose a couple games, one shot, one shot. Yes, uh, that is certainly possible. And uh, for Nick Saban, this is definitely a year to kind of draw a line in the dirt and say, uh, we're not going to fall any further than this. So it is kind of a prove-it year for Alabama. And, uh, again, a little bit of a question of starting quarterback. But, again, it's it's not that either guy sucks. It's that both guys came in highly recruited. And uh, it doesn't seem like a choice that they're going to lose at either way, at least for most of the games on their schedule. For the biggest games on the, their schedule, it's which quarterback is going to be more apt to get it done. This is exactly what we're talking about at Ohio State which has yet to name a starting quarterback coming into the season. So the first month of the season is going to be more interesting than usual for Ohio State because, again, you, you build up to a Notre Dame game where they're going to be decent favorites. But, uh, again, I was there last year, and they struggled with Notre Dame for much of the game uh, to put points on the board. You've got an Ohio State team that, again, it's going to be an interesting September because the quarterback battle may not be done yet. You've got a Michigan team that is going to be rotating coaches in the absence of Jim Harbaugh through the first four games of the season here. So you, you've got Penn State nipping at their heels, trying to prove that they belong at that level. Uh, a Maryland team that, that's trying for the come up. A Michigan State team that's trying to kind of dig out from where they've been the last couple of years. So an interesting East Division and, again, a more interesting September than usual for Ohio State and Michigan and route to what will probably be 
uh, the, the climactic battle in the Big Ten this year. Well, well, well Rick, with me, it's funny. Uh, if Michigan beats, uh, you know, you know, obviously at the end of the year, three straight wins for Harbaugh over, over Ryan Day, there's going to be a little heat on him. I mean, I mean he'll probably get a, get a pass with the 12 team playoff next year, but if the 12 team playoff wasn't happening, he'd be, you know, the U.S. lighting director going to be in town. You know, I mean, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of pressure for them to win that game. But uh, right now, I think Michigan's first. Well, they may be, but what what's interesting is uh, and potentially highly likely, you could be looking at a rematch of that game in all all things the Rose Bowl because. If either Georgia or Alabama is number one, then they're going to be playing the bowl game closer to home this year. Uh, that, of course, being uh, the Sugar Bowl. Imagine Georgia and Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, Ohio State and Michigan in the Rose Bowl, and that very well could happen in the last year of the four-team playoff. How fitting would that be? It does look good. The first thing you've seen in Rick in the Big Ten is Wisconsin is fickle. He left Cincinnati for this job, which some people like, you know, scratch your head a little bit, but... That was definitely the right move. They might be a sleeper team that people are um, to be Exactly. Uh, you've got a West division that is going to be uh, not necessarily wide open, but uh, you, you've got Wisconsin reasserting itself with Fickle there. Iowa is a perennial contender in, in the division. They're going to be uh, way up there, even though offensively last year they, they were just completely awful. And uh, their offensive coordinator, the coach's son, is really on the, the seat, the hot seat this year. Uh, Illinois with Brett Bielema coming back and uh, showing that, uh, again, even if he was a bust at Arkansas based on his past record at Wisconsin, uh, he's definitely a top-notch coach in at least the Big Ten West, no question about that. You've got uh, P.J. Flick, who went through some uh, turmoil in the offseason with some of the media reports at Minnesota, but they've got a perennially good team. Uh, Nebraska coming off of the Scott Frost what I would consider to be inexplicable debacle, because it seemed like that was a guy made for that job. You bring in Matt Rule now, who, again, was a bust at the NFL level, but has been strong in college. So the West Division, it's one of these things where, uh, again, it's not that it's deeper than the East, but it's more interesting than the East, because there's nobody that's as strong as Ohio State or Michigan, or probably even Penn State, but a lot of teams that are good to pretty good. Yeah, that's actually the case. I mean, that's the... That's the one thing about the Big Ten, uh, you know, I mean, we, may not, we may not get the, you know, the Big Ten championship match that we expect, but the thing is, Big Ten is going to be fun, fun football, smash on football, and, um, and, um, and, and, you know, in the winter, I mean, you know, some teams can use the cold weather as their advantage. Well, and in terms of what's at stake here, these games in the Big Ten West this year, I think, are going to carry more importance than they generally do among the contenders, because... This is the end of the Big Ten West bye to the championship game. As the Big Ten expands in 2024 and does away with divisions and welcomes in, oh, by the way, USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington, it's one of these deals where these teams that are here in the West are going to be in all likelihood looking up at probably all four of those teams as well as Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, so this may be their last chance for some period of time to be able to break through and make it to the championship game because as much as we've been saying, oh, well, you know, it is it is what it is as far as the Big Ten championship game and the West team is going to get mowed down by the East, from here on in, you're going to be looking at some kind of poo-poo platter of Ohio State, Michigan, USC, Oregon, Washington, Penn State, maybe UCLA in the Big Ten championship game. It's going to be more meaningful than ever 2024 going forward, but in 2023, the last year to be able to make it that far, guaranteed for one of these teams in the soon-to-be-defunct West Division, you know, basically, they all need to be there to have some kind of a boost going forward to try to compete with all the big dogs in a much deeper conference. Well, this year, it's, it's crying to get to, get to the chance to win it, because next year, if you get to, if you get to the chance to win you lose, you probably have most of the, the big power Five conferences like the SEC, Big Ten, the the loser will probably make the playoff and any regardless. So it's going to, that's going to be different than that. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I think the new system is stupid going forward. As far well, again, I've always been a proponent of just a four team playoff, so I don't like the expansion to begin with. But those four games the first weekend, they ought to be at neutral sites. Just convert more bowl games. I mean, how hard would it be to take uh, the Outback Bowl, the Alamo Bowl, the Holiday Bowl? You know, just take a couple of these ones here. 
and uh, maybe uh, the, uh, what, the, the remnants of the old Gator Bowl. Just take a couple of them and convert them into first-round uh, playoff games here. I, I would rather see that than the games at the sites in December. I, I think that's going to be kind of dumb. Well, one thing they might possibly do is you know, they might play some of these games in those domes. And, you know, uh, if the weather's really that bad, which, which would be kind of stupid if you're if you're you know if you're playing SEC team that's just a cold weather. Yes, and uh, teams I guess will have the option of playing in uh, whatever the nearest dome is. But uh, in, in many cases, that's not going to be necessarily too close to anybody's campus. Now, it's a thing where, for Michigan, that would be a matter of, okay, you could just move it to Ford Field. It's not that far from your campus. But like you said, if you're playing an SEC team, you're giving up the home field advantage vis-a-vis the weather. So I don't know how likely it would be for, for that to happen moving forward. But uh, the Big Ten is uh, on the cusp of uh, a lot, a lot of change going forward. Really, all these conferences are because, again, uh, the SEC is about to add, of course, Texas and Oklahoma in 2024. So in this last season, before all of these earthquake moves basically happen, the only real big one, by the way, is uh, the new deal with the Big Ten, uh, where they're not on ABC and ESPN anymore, but uh, the games will be going to CBS. A handful of games that they can build around their last year of the SEC. Of course, the SEC moves to ABC and ESPN in 2024, and the new uh, primetime NBC games, and a handful of games exclusive to Peacock as well as part of the NBC deal. But uh, the Big 12, uh, they don't uh, have anything changing this year as far as their uh, TV deal or anything like that. No teams coming in, or no teams moving out. They do have some teams uh, coming in. Uh, you, you've got uh, the likes of uh, Cincinnati and Houston, uh, BYU, UCF. you got a couple of teams coming in the last year of Texas and Oklahoma. This is the year that a lot of people feel that Texas is going to be poised to take that step up and win the Big 12. I happen to be one of those people. You've got uh, Kansas State, the defending champion in the mix, TCU, Oklahoma. TCU graduated a lot of key pieces, and they're going to have that critical game with Colorado Week 1 that's going to be under the national spotlight for many reasons. And, uh, again, Texas Tech uh, sort of at the periphery of the mix, Baylor, Oklahoma State, so... It's going to be a really interesting year for uh, the Big 12 uh, as they expand before losing Texas and Oklahoma, before adding uh, four more teams, at least four more teams so far in 2024. Well, well Rick, I think it's going to be a collision of Texas and Oklahoma going into the Big 12 championship. I'm sure the Big 12 Conference Commissioner would love to have a, a, non, a non-Texas and Oklahoma team in there just so those, those teams can't walk away with a, a, a Big 12 championship the, the last year and they're going with the SEC. One team to keep an eye on Rick as a sleeper is um, Texas Tech. Keep an eye on week three at home against Oregon. I, I think that's a winnable game trip. Oregon tends to lose games that they're supposed to win, and I, I, I think Texas Tech can beat Oregon. They're not in the top 25 yet, but I mean, Texas Tech will be a top 25 team this season. Well, that's a real clip and save. We'll have to keep an eye on that one with your recommendation. And as far as Texas and Oklahoma goes, I mean, that's one of those things where, again, I'm not saying that any referees' whistles are going to get in the way of this happening necessarily, but if you're the powers that be in the Big 12, you've got to be thinking to yourself, this is sort of the equivalent. Like, if there'd never been a Montreal screw job and Bret Hart showed up on Nitro with the WWF championship, that would sort of be the equivalent of Texas and Oklahoma coming out of the Big 12 championship game showing up in the SEC the next year. Well, there's a lot of pressure for Texas when Steve's going to start using it. They have a bad year. That's going to be in a hot seat with him. And also, you have Quinn Ewers. People, some people have him as a, as a possible top 10 NFL draft prospect this year if he plays to, to his potential. Yes. Which is kind of, which is kind of, he might be a third quarterback taken in the draft next year, which you know, um, behind the um, um, North Carolina and uh, USC quarterbacks. Yes. Well, that would be uh, amazing because, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting quarterback class in next year's draft, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, you've got uh, the ACC, which, uh, as we start to work our way down the interesting scale of conferences right now, uh, they're more interesting than the Pac-12, just based on the fact that they're going to continue to exist going forward, uh, thanks to that strangulation grant of rights that everybody signed through 2026. So the team that's the favorite in the conference this year by most people, including myself, Florida State, they've been making noises about potentially leaving. It was interesting that they'd actually brought in some private equity to I'm guessing the idea would have been maybe to front them the money to uh, break the grant of rights and move on, but nothing happened for right now, and that wouldn't have affected anything on the field this season. So you've got Florida State, 
Clemson looming is probably the top two teams in the conference right now. But as you mentioned, North Carolina, a uh, very interesting uh, team this year, poised to kind of make a, a jump up. Really, as I'm looking at the three, four, five teams in the conference here, North Carolina, North Carolina State, Duke, uh, you're going to have the uh, very interesting opportunity, Fran, being in the triangle to see some very weighty games this year. Well, Duke well, were not at home last year. They, they, had, they definitely have potential. They might, on, on, on Labor Day night, I think they're going to give Clemson a good game. I mean, the, uh, they're playing at home against Clemson. I think it's going to be, it might be a little bit closer than the experts think. Not that the term Clemson is going to exist, but I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a situation, it's going to be bunking in the watch Labor Day. A game that, um, the, the yeah, high scoring antiques do got average 30 points a game, so they'll be able to keep up, you know, score, put some points on the board. Absolutely, and uh, you start to scroll a little down, further down into the conference, uh, some of the teams that look to be in maybe the middle of it, Louisville, Wake Forest, it's very jarring uh, that Miami is one of the teams there, and uh, you know Mario Cristobal, he wasn't hired to have this team mired in the midst of the ACC. you got to think that it's a, a make-or-break kind of a year, particularly as Miami is trying to make itself more attractive on the college football landscape going forward, and uh, if they were able to do like Florida State, maybe get the money fronted to them to break the grant of rights. Miami isn't a hot enough team right now to where the SEC or anybody else is going to be selling their souls to try and get them. So you got to think it's a make-or-break year for the Hurricane program under this regime. Well, I think Crystal is the right guy for the job. He's a local guy. I think Miami will eventually be better, but it's, it's hard. It's, it's not going to happen this year, right? Not yeah, this year. I don't think so either. I, I think they're going to be about in the middle of the pack. And then we go to... RIP, a conference that doesn't look like it's going to exist anymore, the Pac-12. And uh, when we talk about uh, the circumstance here of uh, a lame duck team winning the championship, it's almost guaranteed to happen because you've only got four teams right now that aren't lame ducks, and none of them really projects close out to the top. Oregon State could potentially be on the fringes of the conversation, uh, but ultimately... Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Washington State uh, or Cal or Stanford will be. But uh, a lot of people are thinking USC is the favorite with Washington and Oregon right behind them. Utah is just a team year in and year out that you can never count out of this thing. UCLA has uh, gotten off to the kind of start in the Chip, Carey era, Chip Kelly era that I think they were looking for. So in, in looking at this year, this last run for the Pac-12, or at least as we know it, it may get slapped onto a lesser conference moving forward as far as the name goes, but in the last run uh, of the Pac-12 in the, the form that it's been associated with in the public mind, uh, it should be an interesting one start to finish. And we haven't even mentioned Colorado yet, who is the biggest variable in college football bar none. And again, my man Jason Jones, FDH senior editor, right in the middle of covering it, We've never seen anything like this with the advent of the way the, the transfer portal has essentially turned into de facto free agency in college. Uh, all of the high draft pedigree guys that he has brought into that program, but it's brand new. They've only had the offseason together, no chance to build game cohesiveness. Uh, Colorado is the very big variable in this conference, and I'd say on the entire college football landscape this season. Yeah, I mean, Coach Prime is everything I've been those two games, they're not going to be TCU, but I think they're going to be in the rest of the season at home. Yeah. I think that's the game that the Silver Club would want to, you know, that's the game with, you know, with the breast on a rebuild, on a rebuild situation. That's a winnable game for, for, for Colorado. I think the team, the, the team that's going to win this conference is, is, is USC and California. They tend to have hiccups towards, you know, every once in a while, but I think this year they finally have breakthrough. And, um, I, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure he's going to win the Heisman two years in a row, but he's going to put a pinball in the video game numbers, and uh, I think that's going to be good. Oregon's a team to keep an eye look out for, because, I mean, Bill Nix um, might be a quarterback. I uh, thought he was going to keep, keep a look out. You know, um, he might be a guy that's playing the NFL someday. He might be. And uh, in looking at the, uh, the rest of the college football landscape, the other conferences here, uh, you've got uh, people talked about that the Mountain West, uh, that there could be some kind of, uh, merger going down to what's left of uh, the Pac-12 because uh, there's been more renewed talk of uh, Cal and Stanford potentially along with SMU uh, to the ACC. So basically that would mean wherever Oregon State and Washington State go from here on in, they have the right to take the name with them. And if I'm the Mountain West, I I'd like to trade up 
uh, in what's going to be the last year of the Mountain West as we know it uh, if there is a merger. Uh, I've, I've got Boise State coming out on top. Uh, the team that I believe out of any of these conferences that I believe is going to make what will be the last of the New Year's Six Bowls and, and get that spot in there, I believe, is going to be the team that wins the AAC. And to me, that's going to be Tulane. So your thoughts on the other five conferences, Fran? Well, I think Tulane, I mean, um, when they beat USC in the uh, Bowl, they really – they really stepped up and performed well. Uh, I mean, Boise State, I mean, you know, they, they tend to, every every couple of years, put, put together a good team. Um, as far as the other conferences, I mean, the MAC, I mean, they, they get close. I mean, we get to watch them on Thursdays in November. Right? And now Conference USA is going to have, uh, um, like, weekday games in, in October we can watch. Conference USA, all those teams, you know, Island and Vista teams, you know, Mexico State and some other teams. Yeah. So it's interesting to get to watch these teams then. Of course, I always love to watch my Ohio Bobcats uh, in in any of those uh, midweek games. And uh, I'm optimistic. I think this is the year in the MAC uh, for them. But uh, my predictions that I have for the season, uh, these are in Fantasy Football Draftology 2023, available on the main page at fantasydrafthelp.com. I've got in the Orange Bowl, LSU over Penn State. Cotton Bowl, USC over Texas, Peach Bowl, Florida State over Tulane, Cotton Bowl, Washington over Clemson, and in the playoffs, uh, Georgia over Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. I have that as a 1-4, the 2-3 game, the Rose Bowl. Ohio State over Michigan. So I've got Ohio State actually losing again in the regular season game, getting their revenge in the Rose Bowl. College football title game, can Georgia go for the three-peat? My answer is yes. I have them winning over Ohio State in the championship game. So I, I'm guessing that probably a, at least a lot of the way that you see it, Fran, is probably similar to that. I, I think Georgia's going to repeat. Uh, I mean, USC might be a, it might be a possibility to get into the, the playoffs as well. Uh, I think if USC has you know, play, you know plays like that, because the start of the season is so highly ranked, so that helps a little bit. But then again, teams came out of nowhere last year, right, like TCU and Michigan and um, – they made it to the playoffs. They did. It's going to be a really fascinating uh, landscape. Uh, any other thoughts on the uh, 2023 season, Fran? Well, it's an exciting one with the, you know, with, you know, the last year of the 14th playoffs. So you can do a lot more. But it's going to be a fun season to watch. It definitely is. Looking forward to it and uh, getting your thoughts on it. Uh, we always get together again in December to uh, preview the bowl and playoff season. I'm looking forward to that. And, of course, our next segment on the show is going to be one where you and I are breaking down the college football realignment landscape. Thank you so much for your time, Fred Stuckberry, and thank you all of us, everybody out there for joining us for FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1650.